Welcome to Old Testament Survey 1, the books of the law. This is lesson number six, uh, and lesson number six is on the book of Numbers, which is really the story of Israel in the wilderness. We've been in uh, the books of the law, been journeying from the stories of Adam and Noah uh, to Abraham and his sons in Genesis, to the story of Moses in Exodus, uh, to the story of God's holiness last week in Leviticus. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the story of wandering in the wilderness uh, with Israel. This uh, time period covers a period of time from the exit of Egypt in uh, approximately uh, 1491 BC to 1451 BC. Uh, we're going to talk about a 40-year period in the desert, and the key to this period is an 11-day journey from Egypt to the Promised Land turns into a 38-year journey of defeat. So the story really is about how to turn victory into defeat, and we really want to look at the messaging of that story to understand how it applies both to the nation of Israel and how it applies to our lives. <clears throat> so how do we do that? First, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever witnessed an undeniable miracle in your life, one that you know was from God and by God, regardless of what others think about that circumstance in your life, when you look at it and you go, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. I, I know I'm not capable of that. Or the circumstances had so surround you and the escape seemed so impossible from those circumstances, and yet there it was. And so uh, something that was undeniable to you, you knew and understood, you were crying out to God, and God uh, met you in that place of crying out, uh, met you in that moment of pain, and there you were with the uh, hope and the promise of the miracle uh, and uh, then you immediately after it uh, pretended as though it never happened uh, for, I don't know about for you, but uh, I've had those moments of undeniable miracles in my life where I have seen God move and work and act. And then I can see after those times uh, the moments where I behaved and acted as though uh, it never occurred uh, and God didn't exist. Um, and so um, the challenge in our lives, the challenge for us is to take the um, evidence of God, those undeniable moments of the experience of God in our lives, and then move forward um, in our lives uh, in concert with that as opposed to uh, ignoring it. And so that question exists, and, and at the heart of the question really is going to be a question of sovereignty and uh, rebellion. And the book of Numbers is really a book about uh, documenting rebellion. And so we can start with that rebellion as the, um, the Israelites are moving out from the camp in the wilderness towards the promised land. And if you look in chapters 2 through 10, you see that, that moving out even has a, a specific, very precise arrangement. God spends time placing people in specific arrangement as they move, and he's guiding them in that arrangement. And so the tribes are, are listed out, uh, and if you were to look down on that from uh, a top view as the Israelites are moving out, they're arranged in the shape of a cross. They're moving uh, with three tribes to the north, and three tribes to the south, and three tribes to the east, and three tribes to the west, and the Levites are uh, carrying the tabernacle, and God is leading them in his presence. And so uh, there's a very precise arrangement. And even beside the tribes, if you think about it, think about the beauty and the majesty of God. He's not just got the tribes, but within the tribes, if you're a member of that tribe, there's a specific place for you. There's a specific spot for you in the movement towards the promise. And only you can fill that space, that spot, as you move from slavery in Egypt to uh, the promised land. And, and uh, yet there are uh, times in our life when we're told to be in a specific place and to be in a specific order because God has a specific plan for us. And uh, I move two steps to the left or two steps to the right and go, well, I want to stand here or I want to go this way. And so as they're moving and setting out in the first uh, t 10 chapters towards the promised land, there begins the process of complaining in the camp. And complaining actually is going to act as a warning sign for us. And you can see that complaining occurring 
Um, in chapters 11 and 12, complaining leads to criticism. There's a question about uh, provision. Uh, did we, uh, were we taken out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? And, you know, God rains down food from heaven, uh, both in the form of manna and quail, bread and meat, uh, to uh, provide for them as evidence and in response to the complaining. Um, but that complaining, that warning sign, continues uh, as it goes to criticism of the leadership, um, and then not just criticism, but outright rebellion. In chapter 13, spies are sent out uh, to look at the promised land. So here they are. They have moved uh, towards the promised land. Uh, they are now ready to scope out the promised land. And the 12 that are sent out, 10 come back. And 10 of the uh, 12 come back. 10 of the 12 report uh, and only see the problem. They see the giants in the land. They do not see how it's possible to overcome uh, the circumstance of the inhabitants of the land to uh, readily accept, Jacob and, and Caleb readily accept the promise of God and see the uh, promise in the land, uh, exactly what God had, had promised, uh, a land flowing of milk and honey, uh, giants uh, or uh, grapes, uh, they see the size of the promise, not the size of the problem. And uh, so uh, there's, uh, a, there's a, an immediate choice put before the people, and that choice results in a rebellion. They refuse to move forward, although God has made a promise that they will capture the land. And that uh, rebellion uh, results in judgment. And we're going to see that rebellion resulting in judgment uh, with the rebellion of Korah and the leaders in chapter 16. Uh, and we see, um, we, we see that uh, multiple times the earth is going to open up and swallow them in chapter 16. We see the rebellion of the people because of the lack of water. And we see uh, the rebellion and, uh, as a result of worship of Baal. Uh, at the heart of the rebellion is a question. And that question is, who's in charge? God is leading them as, as they've left the wilderness and head towards the promised land, and he's directing them to what he's promised them. And yet, uh, when they see the promised land, they refuse to accept that, uh, that uh, order to go take the land. They refuse to accept the leadership of God. Uh, they are, in, in fact, rejecting God himself by refusing to reject his sovereignty over them. And so that... A uh, question of who's in charge and the consequence of that rebellion is really going to result in self, uh, self-government self versus God-government. And uh, what we know about that is that judgment, a rebellion, means we're going to be separated from God, and that leads to death. And so we see that the consequence of rebellion and judgment is death, and that this is how, uh, at its heart, uh, the children of Israel turn an 11-day journey uh, and the promise of 40 uh, into the prom the uh, sorry the uh, uh, problem of 40 years of wandering into into defeat and so the promise of an 11 day journey in the promised land becomes a 40 year uh, defeat going from victory uh, to death and they do so because of rebellion and rebellion against the direction and commandments of God that rebellion's met by judgment it always is and uh, so we uh, take away from wa uh, wandering in the wilderness and the book of Numbers, this question that's put before us, the direction that God has placed in our life, the precise place that he's placed us in the arrangement in the camp and the direction that he's given us to move in a direction and the purpose and the promise of our life. And the question will be twofold. One, do we believe that promise? Do we believe that he is a God that is able to both make that promise and keep that promise? And then the second is, the second big question of our lives that come out of the book of Numbers is, am I willing to follow that? Am I willing to follow God's direction, meaning he's in charge, or am I will, unwilling to do that and resist and you know, demand that I stay in charge of my life? That question will be the question that leads to either the receipt of the promise of God or the rejection of God and the judgment of God and resulting in death and separation from God. That's really what a failure to follow is. The failure to follow is 
God uh, does not interfere, uh, failure follows, God does not interfere with God's ability to keep his promises. Just because we don't follow him doesn't mean God doesn't follow through on his promises. And we see this in the book of Numbers. This is the reason why the book is called the book of Numbers, because in the beginning, there's a census taken. 601, 730 men are counted uh, heading out from the wilderness. This is the number of people heading out. And I want you to think about this. A promise is made to approximately 600,000 men. Uh, in total, it's probably about a million two to a million five Israelites because of women and children added in. So about a million and a half people are promised. And, um, and they reject the promise along the way. And so rather than God saying, well, they rejected it, I'm not going to fulfill the promise, he raises up an entirely new generation of about 600 men, 600,000 men. And so he fulfills the promise, and he fulfills it to almost exactly the number. In fact, he fulfills it to slightly uh, more than the number who had originally he had made the promise to. He didn't need to do this. He didn't need to, uh, because this was a conditional covenant and because it required obedience, he could have simply said, well, they refuse to acknowledge and accept my promise, therefore uh, it is no longer valid. He raises up an entirely new generation. That's true of our lives today. God makes a promise to us uh, if we were to follow him and make him sovereign over our lives. And then he honors the choice that we make, and he doesn't interfere with that choice. He offers it up to us, and he makes it available to us, and he's given us a specific place of ministry in the arrangement in the camp of the church. And yet if we reject that promise, he'll raise another up to take our place. And the promise and the fulfillment of that promise in our lives and the fulfillment of the purpose of our lives will be taken by somebody else. And God's purposes will be done as a result of it. The question really is, do you want to participate in that promise and participate in that purpose and have real meaning in your life as opposed to having real control or perceived control over your life? Is it so important in our lives that we make the decisions that we make and we make them against what God has told us to do or promised us to do? so much so that we're willing to lose the purpose of our lives. There is no purpose apart from this. We were created for this meaning and for this reason. And so that uh, choice is put before us. But in all of this, God demonstrates his trustworthiness as a promise keeper. Uh, think about the time and the effort it took to fulfill the entering of the promised land. An 11-day promise meant the God's promises would have been fulfilled in an earlier time frame. Yet he was patient and willing and raised up an entirely new generation of people and taught them his laws again. So that he demonstrates the choice we have in participating or rejecting the promises offered to us. This week, as you think through the lesson of the book of Numbers, I'd like you to think through the promise that God has made you. What is that promise? He's offered you salvation and the acceptance of Jesus Christ. He's asked that uh, his son and uh, God the Father and God the Spirit remain sovereign over our lives, that we follow him, not just for out of uh, loyalty or out of some exercise of obedience, but because it leads to the fulfillment of the promise and the fulfillment of the purpose of our lives. So what is that fulfillment? God has asked us to spread his word to uh, go forth to the world and make disciples of all the nations. He's asked us to uh, minister as ministers of the body of believers, both to the world and to the body itself. Those are our purposes uh, as a church and as a member of the church body, as the called out group of believers. How are we living those promises today? Are we living them uh, like the Israelites? Are we turning an 11-day journey into a 40-year uh, lap through the wilderness, wandering in the wilderness of defeat? Or are we in obedience to God's promises in our lives so that we can enter into the promised land that he's given us, both now and then? Uh, he calls us into that promised land today to be in fellowship with him, to be in his presence. That's the promised land of the church of believers. And we're called to enter into that promised land. And, and so are we being obedient? Are we allowing God to direct and guide our lives so that we can live in victory instead of defeat? 
Uh, that's the question for us out of the book of Numbers this week. And so I look forward to next week where we close out the books of the law and we close them out with the book of Deuteronomy, the uh, second giving of the law or the re repeating of the law. It's a review book and gives us a chance to look back at the journeying from the garden to the promised land as God takes us from the moment of our rebellion and humanity and Adam and then brings us to a land that he will establish a nation that he is ruling over as a picture and an image of how God wants to rule over our lives so that he keeps us and protects us and uh, fulfills us in uh, the intention of our, our lives and the purpose of our lives. I pray a blessing over you this week as you uh, search for uh, the direction that God has put in your life. I pray for uh, clarity and I pray for um, God to speak to your heart in the areas that uh, may be uh, showing resistance and rebellion, that he would raise those to your understanding, to our understanding, so that we can release them and be renewed and refreshed this week. Uh, and I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.